Hi everybody, my name is Jamie and I'm a solution engineer here at HashiCorp and today I'm going to be taking us through how we can secure access to Kubernetes with HashiCorp Boundary. So to start us off, I just wanted to remind everybody why secure access is so important by looking at some data from a Verizon report that analyzed a lot of security incidents and data breaches over the previous year. So what they summarized out of the report is that out of all these security incidents, um, the vast majority of them involved some sort of human actor. That is probably the most obvious statistic out of these three. The next one is how many of these security incidents involved the misuse of a credential, either a credential being accessed by someone who shouldn't have had access to it, or a credential being given too much privilege than it should have been given. It's still really high. It's still 61% of these security incidents. And then finally, a little bit of contrary to popular belief is how many of these incidents involved some sort of security vulnerability being exploited. This is really low. It's 3%. And what I would take away from these three statistics is that in any organization, the weakest component is us. It's the human actors which pose the most risk. It's not necessarily the technology that we use. Now, to start unpacking this problem a little more, I want us to go through six of the most common principles of secure access. The first one being one you've definitely heard of before, and that is least privilege. This is to say, we want to give the user enough privilege for them to be successful in their role, but no more. The next one is any assets that we create as part of a secure access workflow, we want to do so on demand. It's not limited just to the credential. It's also including policy, service accounts, tokens. We want to generate them only when we need them. Next, at the network layer, we want to provide access that takes our user directly from their laptop to the target host and don't give them any inherent access to other hosts on that same subnet. Any type of credential that we create, we also want to be time limited. We don't want these credentials to last forever. So we want them to have some kind of ability to auto expire. And then also any credential that we do create, we want to have been created uniquely for us, not just from an auditability perspective, but from a risk perspective. We don't want to share credentials ever. And then finally, anything that takes place within this workflow, we want to uh, not exist when we start the workflow, be created just in time uh, when we need it, and then to be deprecated when we're finished with it. That's to say nothing exists after this workflow has finished. So let's take a look at two of the most common authentication patterns that I see in enterprise environments today for developers accessing Kubernetes. So the first one is my developer over here called Bob, who's in the corporate LAN network. He wants to access this Kubernetes cluster over here on the right, which is in some kind of distant VPC network. Now, in order to create this access, he's going to use his laptop to SSH to some sort of well-known piece of infrastructure. Now, this might be a dedicated SSH bastion host. It also might commonly be some kind of build server, a CICD server. And they're going to potentially log in with a shared user and use that user's um, inherent identity with either an assume role, Maybe they authenticate through LDAP. Um, maybe they just use the long-lived credential that exists on the CI/CD server in order to generate that kube config and authenticate to the Kubernetes API. Now, I think everybody in here would agree that this particular workflow has a lot of room for improvement. But let's have a look at another really common workflow that we see. And that's with our developer over here on the left called Jane. So Jane is going to, just the same from her laptop, um, she's going to 
probably pre-authenticate with her organization's identity provider, something like an Okta, and use the cloud CLI to generate dynamically a kube config. She's then going to use that kube config to directly communicate with the Kubernetes API to deploy her application. Now, between these two, they both have, um, I would say, areas that could be improved. There's definitely areas where both of these do not meet our secure access principles. And the first one is a little bit obvious. It's, it's this CI CD server. So any shared common piece of infrastructure potentially has a lot of risk associated with it. We could be using common users. Um, we could be sharing credentials. And from an audit, auditability perspective, this shared component makes it really, really difficult for us. The next area where we're not meeting our secure principles is down here at the network layer. So even though we used a dynamic credential and dynamically created that kube config, we still have persistent network access to the Kubernetes API. And sometimes that might even be over the public internet. So let's take a look at this workflow again, but this time we're going to build it with Boundary. So this time my developer, who's called Carlos, is exactly the same in the corporate network. He's going to have a Kubernetes cluster over here on the right. And this time we've got a couple of namespaces deployed. I've got my app namespace that I want to give Carlos access to. And I've also got my info namespace where I'm going to deploy a few tools. So Carlos's laptop um, is going to use the Boundary CLI to authenticate to Boundary, which I've already deployed in Kubernetes. The other tool that I've deployed here is HashiCorp Vault. If this is the first time you've heard about Vault, Vault is HashiCorp's identity broker a secrets lifecycle management tool, and we're going to use Vault to create some of these identity assets on demand. So the workflow is Carlos is going to authenticate, probably over OIDC, to his organization's identity provider, just the way Jane did before. And from there, we're going to ask Boundary to provision us access into the app namespace. So to do that, Boundary is going to leverage Vault to create on demand a Kubernetes role which contains our RBAC privileges and a Kubernetes service account. And we're going to create these both in the app namespace. We're then going to pass these back in the form of a dynamic credential to Carlos. And then he's going to use them to create his kube config. And at this point, we're not going to go directly to the Kubernetes API. Our connection is going to be tunneled point to point from our developer's laptop through the Boundary worker to the Kubernetes API in what Boundary calls an identity aware proxy. This means that Carlos only has access to the Kubernetes API. You can't access other things within that subnet. There's no inherent underlying access available to him. So this workflow is going to allow us to use our same kubectl command to provision our HashiBank pod. And then after this is all finished, we're going to remove them two assets that we created. We're going to remove that dynamic role and that dynamic service account. So let's take a look at this workflow in action. So I'm going to jump over to my terminal. And the first command that I'm going to run is going to be a kubectl get contexts. So all this command is going to show is that I haven't got anything pre-configured. There's nothing, um, there's, there's no access uh, configured as of right now. And the first thing I'm going to do is authenticate to Boundary. It's going to ask me for my password. And it's going to give me a Boundary token. Next, we want to request from Boundary to create this dynamic credential and create them underlying assets on our behalf. To make it really easy to follow in the demo, I've wrapped up them commands in a short bash script, which when I run is going to request the access from Boundary and then stand up that underlying tunnel. So it came back and confirmed, yep, 
we've given you access to this Kubernetes cluster and it's available on this uh, high range port number. So now if I was to run my kubeconfig get context, we'll see that there's been a context created for the app namespace with my boundary user. So just to double check that I'm definitely authenticated as my um, dynamic service account, I can run this kubectl who am I command to confirm that I am using a service account for the app namespace. And it's got this really strange name. So it's called vtoken read only and then some random UUID. That sounds like something that Vault has dynamically created on our behalf. So let's just check that we do have access. I'm going to run a kubectl get pods. So now I can see that I can at the very least list my pods. Let's take a look at the role that I've been given access with. You can see that we created um, from HashiCorp Vault a couple of rules. One that gives me the ability to read only pretty much anything. And then another one that gives me the ability to read my own role. But that's it. So if I was to now have a look at the service accounts that exist within my Kubernetes cluster, we'll see that, of course, I have the default service account. But we'll see that service account that we saw earlier. And it's only been around for 97 seconds. That's because this service account only got created when we ran this command up here. So let's take another look at that role. And we'll see it also was created on demand. So it didn't exist before we started this process. So let's try and do something outside of our role. Let's try and delete the HashiBank pod. So it's going to come back and say, you know, permission denied. Sorry, the service account that you created uh, doesn't have the ability to do that. And that's because the service account was created um, specifically for me with a set of privileges suitable for me, which means we can really easily lock this down. If I was to, at this point, suspect some sort of security incident within my infrastructure, I might want to revoke all of these um, service accounts on demand. So this command is just going to go to Vault and say, remove anything that you've created with this role. And when we run it, Vault is going to uh, deprecate uh, my own permission. And it's going to remove them assets. So it's going to remove that service account, and it's going to remove that role. And we know that's the case, because if we run uh, Kubernetes get pods, it's going to tell me I can't authenticate. So even though it hasn't touched any of the underlying kube config on my um, on Colossus laptop, um, we don't have access because it's removed the underlying service account. And just to double check that it did remove them underlying assets, I'm going to log back into my cluster, but this time as a cluster admin, just to just for the purposes of this demo. And then we're going to run that same command. We're going to say show me the roles and service accounts within the app namespace. And it's going to come back, and they're gone. It's just the default service account. So everything that was provisioned for our access has been removed after our access was required. So I know that's a lot to go through on the terminal. So I just want to step through it a bit more um, on my slides. So let's take a look at why that workflow was so much more secure. So here's that same diagram at the top. And we're going to go through and see how we did with our secure principles. So the first place I want to draw your attention is up here on the right. So that role that we created on demand that contained our RBAC privileges was only created when we needed it. And it was removed once we were finished. Exactly the same with the service account. That means we're able to programmatically give somebody only the right amount of privilege. So when I try to delete the HashiBank pod, I wasn't able to. That's because I was provisioned a role that was specific for me. Next thing, I've said it a few times already, but all of this was created um, only when required. It didn't persist after we needed it. That means everything you saw here was generated on demand. And of course, if we generate it on demand, um, it's also 
time bound, which means even if we didn't go in there and manually revoke it ourselves, it would automatically expire after about 10 minutes or so. Because that role and service account was generated on demand, it's also not shared. If somebody else in my team needs access into the app namespace, they can authenticate with Boundary CLI themselves and they can get their own credential so that all the credentials that I used are unique only for myself. Next, let's take a look at that network access. So even if that credential that we used for some reason did get persisted, the access from Carlos's laptop to the Kubernetes cluster didn't get persisted, which means after we finish this process, even if I did want to try and log in again, I can't. I don't have network access between the developer's laptop and the Kubernetes API because that proxy tunnel has been removed after it's been required. We only gave Carlos point-to-point -point access to the Kubernetes API. And then finally, once this whole process is finished, all the assets that we created, the tunnel, the service account, and the role are removed so that the potential of something being misused after we have finished using them um, is significantly less because they've been removed from the environment after they're required. So that's, that's my presentation. That is a quick run through on securing Kubernetes access with Boundary. Thank you very much.